Okay, let's answer some questions from the last market outlook. Uh, I think there will be a spike in supply of the houses held by baby boomers hitting the market. It's probably bearish for home builders. Those houses, in a lot of cases, will not be renovated. So I'm looking at housing adjacent stocks. I think Pool and BLD are the plays for this renovation. Uh, uh, I'm confused here. Those houses, in a lot of cases, will not be renovated. I am looking, I am reading that, right? Will not be renovated. Time capsules from the early zero zeros. Uh, hmm. Looking at housing adjacent stocks, pool, and insulation. Uh, I'm not following your logic here. Not Home Depot and Lowe's because those stocks follow home prices pretty closely. Uh, home Depot and Lowe's will follow home prices, but they do a lot better with existing home sales. The higher the level of existing home sales, the better they do because usually there's renovation there. Uh, most common things are building fences, building decks. If you don't think they will be renovated, um, why are you suggesting renovation plays? Or are you saying putting a pool in instead of renovating the house? Insulation, I don't get. Um, yeah, I don't get. I, I'm not sure where you're going with that. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to pass on that. Uh, give the March 29th episode of the Looney Hour on Spotify a listen, specifically from 14 to 25 minutes. They have some really good content. In summary, Immigration Minister Mark Miller announced that they will be aiming to reduce the percentage of non-permanent residents to 5% from 6.5% of the Canadian population within three years. To get to 5%, we would need 200,000 K less non-permanent residences per year over the next three years. In the last year, there has been an increase of 800,000 non-permanent residences, so Negative two would be one million change from the current tra mm, current trajectory. Uh, okay, I see what you're doing. You're multiplying that. It's saying two hundred thousand looks like you're multiplying it by five, but you said within three years. I don't think you can multiply it like that. I don't. I don't think that you can do that. Um, understand what what's going on with with students so let's just draw it out uh, in terms of uh, where they happen to be and we'll assume four-year university uh, there's also three-year college or four-year university uh, and uh, let's say that you um, we'll, we'll say you bring in eight hundred thousand a year and let's say you start it this year you'll have eight hundred thousand in year one the next year you'll have 800,000 in year two plus another 800 here. The next year it'll do this, right? And the next year it'll do this. And then so there's 8888, eight, 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 right? The year after, what is going to happen? Uh, like once you uh, start getting here, the year after they have to leave, right? So you have eight coming in, you have those leaving. You have some leaving here, and you have some that drop out and leave on the way. They are uh, non-permanent, which means they don't stay. So you can't just cumulatively keep adding them up. Uh, permanent residences, you can keep cumulatively adding them up, but the non-permanent ones come in and then they leave. So it, it, your math, the 200,000 multiplying by 5, 1 million change, mm, uh, I don't know. That would bring Canadian population growth from 3.2 to 0.6. Huh? Mm, no. You're now taking that 1 million, which I said that you cannot do, and assuming that you have a 1... And, and now assuming all of that happens in one year. Hmm, no. You're going to have to think through your math a little bit more here. So let's, uh, let's skip this one because I don't know that your conclusions are going to follow.
Uh, do you think with BOC cutting rates early in April, that would put pressure on the U.S. to cut earlier than most? Well, they didn't cut today. Uh, I expected I expected either uh, very uh, very solid talk about a cut or a cut, uh, and it didn't seem like either. I did listen to the press conference, and it was asked, uh, was there any discussion of a cut? And he said, well, there's six of us, you know, so... We all have different opinions, and he was really cagey about it, but he said that we, we reached a consensus. So it seems to me that there were some people on the committee that wanted to cut. Uh, and then he did end it by saying, look, you'll have the summary of uh, deliberations in a couple of weeks, and, and, and you'll see the conversation. I wouldn't be surprised when we get the summary of deliberations to see that, that there were some on the, on the six. Some of the six did want to cut, but we didn't get a cut. Um, but no, I don't think it would put pressure on the U.S. to cut. I think the U.S. is going to do what the U.S. does. Uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, okay. uh, question. Is related to CFE Institute Practical Skills Module. Have you had a chance to assess any of them? No, I have not. Uh, although I have heard uh, from some people who have taken them, uh, and um, particularly the coding one, the Python. Uh, and the response seems to be rather unanimous is that it's really low, uh, it's really low end and that if you go on a YouTube and look for some of the free Python courses on YouTube, you learn a lot more uh, than what was taught. So apparently it's, it's really low, which is consistent with the direction CFAI has been going for the last 10 years, it seems, well, not the last 10, but at least the last five, which is to take out a lot of technical details. I call it dumbing it down, but they refer to it as taking out the technical details so that it would be rather uh, surfacey, simplistic, doesn't surprise me. Particularly since so learning your opinion on the analyst skills module. Didn't see that one at all and heard nothing about that. Uh, Tudor suggests quite a few unorthodox approaches. Eh. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, 30-year U.S. Treasury is reflective of inflation and real GDP. I'm consistently amazed by the sensitivity of the long end of the curve to the regular release macro coincident indicators. Yeah, there is volatility there. 30-year yield has risen 30 basis points in a month on the back of better than expectation job reports and slightly higher than expected inflation. This, of course, is mixed with a whole bunch of mixed PMI results. Seems to be this seems bipolar to have inflation and a real GDP forecast change to the degree with the date. Yeah, I agree. But this is what happens when you, when, when you have a Fed uh, that gives you so much information is you become hyper-focused on every single data point and that every single data point is a do-or-die data point uh, when it should really just be background noise. Uh, but it's not. It's it's like expectations are built around every data point, and there's major market events around every data point. Uh, but yeah, there is uh, significantly more volatility than you would think. But that's the randomness of the market, right? That's a lot of the noise of the market. So, but there is there is heightened volatility there more than more than you would think would be in the thirty year. You'd think that that would be more of an anchor, but it doesn't seem to be. Leon's announced they're building a big development in Toronto. Not your Canadian publicly traded home built Leon's. If you mean Leon's furniture, Leon's. The only Leon's I know is Leon's furniture. I wouldn't touch them. Even if they were building a big development, I still wouldn't touch them. <laughs> Uh, I have a doubt related really to calculation of rate cut expectations using ZQ. If there is a rate cut in June meeting, and the rate implied by the ZQ futures will be 12 uh, and 18. Uh, yeah, so if you're, t if you're gonna, if you were looking at ZQ, ZQ is the average of the Fed funds futures over the course of the month. That would be a correct way to do it, is to uh, wait 12 days by 533 and 18 days by 508. Um, yeah, that, so I'll, I'll agree to that. That would be the cleanest picture you're gonna get is probably the July uh, ZQ July would uh, would have within it the price, but going to the end of the year for the December, I think we're fairly close with December. The meeting happens, I think, 
right at the beginning of the year. I sorry, beginning of the month. But I get what you're saying there. Uh, thank you for doing. Uh, do you think increasing capital market rates portion of the yield curve uh, could have anything to do with the commentary from Bank of Japan? No, no, no. I don't think so. Um, since you're not giving me a reason why it's related to the Bank of Japan, I now have to guess. So if when when you phrase questions like this and you say, "Do you think it has to do with this specifically?" You know, you would you would put a comma and you'd say exactly what. But when you say the commentary from the Bank of Japan, my natural question would be, well, what commentary are you referring to? Uh, because I would have to guess at it now. Not to mention the historic weakness of the end of the U.S. I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say no. I don't think it has anything to do with that, because you haven't given me, you know. Uh, some limiting factors to look at. You've sort of just given me a whole universe of stuff saying, Bank of Japan, weakness in the end. What say you? <laughs> I say I pass. Wondering if you could explain the tax treatment on premium from put selling and subsequent call selling if shares were assigned. Well, that's country specific. Uh, and you can get that right from either Revenue Canada or the IRS. They'll give you the, the treatment of it. Uh, for it depends on whether or not you're holding the underlying. Uh, it depends on whether or not it is speculative or hedging. Uh, so there are different treatments of it depending on how you're using it. So for example, if you're holding shares and you're selling covered calls against those shares, uh, the sale of the call is not income or capital gain or anything. Uh, if the shares are not called away from you, it really just reduces the capital base of the stock that you're holding, and you don't have to claim the capital gain till you sell the, uh, till you actually sell the shares. Oh, I think you can hear the thunder brewing behind me. Are you familiar with Peter Zahan's work? Yes, I am. A uh, good geopolitical analyst, although I will say that his conclusions are rather fatalistic. I, I sort of think it, hear, hear his conclusions and say, well, that's a little much there. You know, in 10 years, China will, 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 will have caved in on itself and, and, and be insignificant. Eh, mm, I get what you're saying about the population demographics in China and about uh, uh, the, the insulation of the premier from the actual real truth of what's going on in China. I get your facts, thank you very much, but the conclusion, yeah, it's a little fatalistic. You know, his conclusion has everybody failing in the U.S. winning and being the only one on the planet in 15 years. It's like, ah, that's a little much. I get you love your Colorado uh, state, but a uh, little much for me. Some questions, uh, income strategy, target of 50, does that mean that every day that passes, this is the gain on income from theta decay on the entire theta sleeve? It should be, it should be holding everything else constant. It doesn't mean you make 50 bucks a day. What it's saying is that you will target a theta decay of about $50 a day, uh, uh, you know, based on how many puts or calls you're selling, you'll base a, a theta a decay on that per day holding everything else constant. If nothing else changed, you'd get the 50. If theta, the measured theta, uh, uh, again, nothing else changed, that measured theta would work out, that's what you would get. But all sorts of things change. Delta will have the biggest effect on, on, on the premium. Sometimes you'll actually lose. Even though theta's working in the background, you'll lose because delta moved against you. Uh, how come IBKR holds margin on long positions? They don't hold margin on long positions. Um, nope. Uh, the, the, only, the only thing you need for a long position is the ability to pay for it. That's all. We do a bond portfolio on IBKR and show how to practically use derivative overlays and the different yield curve strategies taught in level three. You don't actually have to hold bonds to do the derivative overlays. You just have to assume you don't actually have to hold bonds to get that done, and I have done that in the past. Uh, I have uh, shown you how to use uh, actual bonds to uh, replicate TLT. I've shown you how to do curve steepeners and curve flatteners um, with, with uh, uh, futures. Uh, and they're so common, there actually are tickers for it. TUT is the 2 to the 10. Uh, and uh, NOB is the uh, 10 to the 30. 
so you can play curve steepeners and flatteners uh, using those. Uh, I found the following in using paper trading portfolio and portfolio construction models improve my uh, my consolidation of CF material significantly. And yes, that is the point. Uh, is there is the uh, academic and there is the practical. And if you're just focusing on the books and reading the books, you get to the end, you pass an exam, yay. But if you combine it with some kind of practical skill, now CFAI is giving you uh, Python uh, and is giving you uh, financial modeling. Uh, but I think, I think probably the best way to get you up to speed is actually trade, is use a paper portfolio and actually construct portfolios, actually do that. Uh, I think as far as this is great, the financial modeling is great for the analyst in you, uh, and this is great for the asset manager in you. And what is CFA? CFA is for an analyst and for an asset manager, which is why I don't agree with the private wealth management stream because that is a relationship manager. I don't agree with that stream at all. Uh, so, uh, analyst, asset manager, there's the analyst, there's the asset manager, actually get a paper portfolio, million dollars in U.S. cash, and actually build portfolios and manage positions, do a carry trade, do a curve steepener, uh, do a, a duration uh, neutral uh, trade, I uh, uh, shouldn't say a beta neutral trade, build a, 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 a market neutral portfolio. Uh, what else did we do in there? Theta? income uh, allocation factories uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there but actually do it i agree uh i was reviewing uh, the rmda 2023 for cap rate as far as i can tell they mostly undertake apartment upgrades to boost sweet turnover they all do that everybody does that Everyone will, will turn over when they, uh, um, they'll put some kind of uh, CapEx into the suite and boost the uh, revenue for it. It's got great ROI. They all do that. As they point out, lease renewals are subject to restriction, Ontario, BC. Yep, yep. Yeah, this is uh, for, for apartment REITs. This is basically uh, how it works is you get about, usually in normal markets, you get about 30% turnover per year. So if you have a 100-unit building, each year two to three units are moving out, or sorry, each month, two to three units are moving out. Uh, over the course of the year, that's 24 to 36 units. The midpoint is 30%. Uh, when rents are very high, uh, turnover is very low. So you'll get like less than 10% turnover. If, if you have, and here's a timeline, a tenant at the end of the year that decides to stay, you're limited in how much you can raise the rent. But if they move out, you can raise the rent to market rents. When uh, rents uh, are low, uh, or uh, let's just say when uh, financing costs and pricing favor owning a home over renting a home, turnover is high. Uh, when uh, pricing favors renting over uh, um, owning a home, turnover is very low. So it does keep it does keep rental rates down when turnover is low. Uh, so if you get any increase in turnover, it's not as if rents you know rents are going up. It's not as if they do this. Rents will go up. They may do this. You know, in a tougher market, they may go sideways. Um, but yeah, that is that is a limitation faced by all apartment REITs right now is that you have low turnover. Uh, and they're still performing quite well, I think. Uh, I think cap REIT, what, pulled off uh, like 8% uh, NOI growth. That's not bad. Do you usually watch all the Fed speeches? Not really. Um, you know, if they're talking about, uh, you got to look at the title and, and the conference that they're at. If they're talking about banking supervision, that's not really a thing for me. If they're talking about uh, diversity in something, that's not really a thing for me. When they're talking about economic policy or monetary policy, I shouldn't say economic policy, but the state of the economy or, or monetary policy, uh, yeah, I, I tend to, I tend to at least link to the speech and read it quickly. Uh, let's see. Already, uh, already talked about Capri. 
uh, with cost of living increasing in Canada's leftist government, are you worried about the risk of more rent control legislation? Um, well, yeah, you, 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 you do get more of that. And, you know, I, I think more left-leaning governments uh, like to, you know, push more power down to the individual uh, who oftentimes don't really know how to use that power, and, and you tend to get more abuses than anything. Um, I, uh, I don't know that I'm too concerned. I think that the, 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 there is a, uh, a sort of a, a, an unintended consequence of putting in too much rent control uh, is, is that you have more and more people who can never, who can never actually rent a unit. Uh, so if you have very light rent control, let's say that I can kick you out uh, by the 10th of the month if you don't pay me rent. I'm more willing to rent to you. You might be a bit of a credit risk, but if I can kick you out by the 10th of the month, I'm willing to rent to you. But if I cannot kick you out, if I can't kick you out at all, you better have a, have a really good credit score. So what you do when you start making it harder and harder for tenants is you also, uh, sorry for uh, landlords, is you make it harder and harder for tenants to get an apartment. Because I'm not about to take a chance on an unproven individual. I'm not about to take a chance on somebody with low credit score. I'm not about to take a chance on somebody with precarious employment. Uh, you're an Uber driver uh, uh, at night. You're uh, a waiter during the day or a bartender during the day. I'm not going to take the chance on that. I want to see professionals. I want to see five years work history. I want a letter from the employer. I want a credit score over a certain amount. You end up having more people who cannot uh, uh, find housing. This is the unfortunate thing that the more you try to help, the more you get the very thing you're trying to avoid. The more you try to solve homelessness, the more homelessness you will get. The more that you try to uh, uh, give power to the tenants, the harder it is for tenants to get uh, to be able to rent a place. So if anything, it's really just going to upgrade the, the quality of the tenant uh, and a group, of, a group of people, the most vulnerable, as the left like to say, will find it harder and harder and harder. And of course, they'll come in with even more rights and that'll make it even harder to get them in there, right? Think about it. If you can't kick them out, they better be high quality. But if you can kick them out, you're willing to take a chance. Are you hedging out U.S. CAD exchange risk? No, I'm not. I did not get the same message from El Arian. Yeah, I uh, saw him on uh, Bloomberg, and his base case is two cuts. So I don't know um, where Reuters, and it was uh, I think it was Reuters or Barron's, uh, that I got that, uh, that quote from because it was within another story. Uh, I don't know where Reuters or, Bar or Barron's got the quote from, and maybe there's another Elarian out there. A uh, question regarding the applied series, mainly sector analysis. I was thinking it would be a good idea to include a couple of review questions under each sector video. Hmm. Sometimes I want to review the content learned from the video. For example, I go back uh, to a sector video, I ask myself, do I still have a grasp on this particular sector? I know that I could prepare such review questions myself, but I was wondering if you had any plans or had any plans. Um, it's interesting that you say that because it has come up and I have thought about it. Uh, and I, uh, I'll tell you how I've thought about it. Uh, is, is not just asking questions, but asking questions around a particular 10K. Uh, or uh, directing you to a particular uh, investor presentation and then asking you questions that were related to the, uh, to the content. Uh, so something like, uh, you know, what was the uh, growth uh, in a, uh, 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 the AISC uh, for Barrick uh, in 2023? Right, so you'd have to remember, well, what is this again? Barrick Gold, there's a, now as you're going through the presentation, you're becoming familiar with Barrick Gold. What this also allowed me to do when, when I looked at it, asking questions around the 10K, is there's a whole bunch of level one, level two, and level three questions that you could center around a 10K. So I started thinking about that, saying, you know, you could, you could solve a number of, of problems all at the same time. 
Uh, I guess you can hear the thunder going on behind me. So here's what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to stop the video, save what I have, and then start again. So you're probably wondering why I did that. Um, well, with the weather here, uh, you sometimes get flickers in the electricity and then it just ruins everything you've been working on. Can you hear that in the background? I mean, it is really, really coming down out there now. Uh, so yeah, uh, if I, if I uh, do this, it will be in the fall. Uh, but I have thought about that, and I have thought about uh, centering them around the, uh, the, the 10Ks and presentations. And uh, just like that, uh, the rain is uh, sort of just almost stopped now. Which Canadian REITs are you looking, uh, have invested to? Uh, I like CAR.UN. They're just apartment uh, buildings, right? CAR, I like Interrent, and I like KMP. They're all uh, UN dot uh, UN. Uh, I like those three and Minto. I kind of like Minto uh, as well. Northview is uh, still sitting out there with uh, a high yield, a high yield portfolio, but a high risk portfolio. And I just don't like Boardwalk. I, I not that they're not doing well. I just don't like them. <laughs> so I refuse. I refuse to hold a single share of them. Question on jobs, how can all the gains have been uh, in BA uh, Plus while at the same time 60, 19-year-olds uh, have 245,000 jobs? So that is the issue with the household survey, is it's done in different segments uh, and things don't add up. So yeah, they, you'll sometimes get to inconsistencies like that. Uh, money market fund pays interest at first week of every month. markets don't pay interest money market securities don't pay interest uh, will the in, in, increase of MMF come from reinvestment of those mm, uh, that's not how it works um, I don't know I don't know what the funds do funds usually don't pay out but uh, all money market funds are bought at a discount there is no coupon uh, so a three-month security uh, that matures at 100, uh, you'll pay 95, let's say today, and, and it simply just matures at 100. There is no, there is no uh, coupon payment. And then you'll take that 100 and you'll roll it into uh, more money market securities. Of course, they're sold at discounts. You'll just buy more of them. Typically, funds just issue more trust units. So you get more trust units so that usually the, uh, the net asset value holds close to a dollar. Um, they, they would attribute the implied interest to you. Uh, so over the course of the year, you'll have to pay tax on it because it is passed through for the funds. They are passed through. But no, I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, if you have a certain, a certain, um, amount of, uh, of, of interest each month, let's say that, um, you have six trillion, uh, and nobody takes out anything over the course of the year. That that number is going to grow absolutely. But the numbers we're looking at are flows. How much is flowing in and how much is flowing out? Not not the growth of the net asset value. You're looking at funds flows. So it it's not the interest. Does it make sense to look at oil prices in real terms? I've come across a few articles that compare the real oil price today versus history. You conclude that the nominal price should be around a hundred dollars. Nominal price should be around a hundred. What confuses me is that CPI may well be driven by oil price in the first place, and deflating oil prices by CPI creates a chicken and egg problem. Well, this is why uh, there's headline and there's core. Core strips out food and energy because that's volatile, and oftentimes. Uh, uh, will uh, have price reaction that may be uh, uh, uncoupled from the economic cycle altogether. Um, when you look at oil prices, real oil prices, um, what, what, are you, what are you comparing it with? I mean, are you looking at the price of oil 
in terms of silver, in terms of gold, in terms of copper. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I don't know that deflating it by some CPI amount makes a hell of a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I, um, I'd have to see the methodology by which it gets to a real price. Usually real prices are quoted in, in, in relation to something else real. Uh, which is the easiest way to 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 control for something so you would take maybe you know like I think the price of oil has gone up significantly versus the price of silver but it's probably cheaper versus the price of gold so how are you measuring it or how is it being measured in a prior video I recall correctly you once explained how more money at the mall a dollar being spent equates to greater sum in the economy by multiplier effect may you elaborate on that well yeah if I give you a dollar let's say I earn a dollar and I give you a dollar all right you're gonna give some money to your employees you're gonna pay rent and while well, your employee now has money and they're gonna go to the food store and they're gonna buy food right well now the food store plays their employees and that employee is gonna go and pay their rent and then the landlord is probably gonna go and buy I don't know, more paint and paint your apartment and the paint store is going to go and pay their employees. You see that? So a dollar of my expenditure is a dollar of your income. You now have a dollar more income. So it is, uh, you know, how, how often does this happen? How often does that happen in a year? That's called the multiplier is how often uh, uh, money can turn over in a year. That is loud rain out there, isn't it? Given their current valuation differences, is there a prayer trade opportunity with Lyft and Uber? I don't know enough about either one of those companies uh, to, to know the difference. Uh, if there is a big valuation difference, I would look at their margins and I would look at their debt. Uh, Ice Cocoa Futures, May 24 contract. 3343 on July 3rd, 23 versus 10,000 on April 1st, 24. March 25th, 3217 on July 3rd versus 7259 on April 1st. Is this lack of liquidity in the 12? Well, yeah, it's going to be lack of liquidity, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no question about that, but I don't think that's what's creating the problem here. So let's take a typical market and let's take a spot price. Uh, and let's say that the cost of carry is positive. You'll have a futures price above the spot price because the cost of carry is positive. And you'll have a curve that looks like this. This is called contango. All right? Now, watch what I'm going to do here. So, just so you can understand how something goes into backwardation. The spot market gets tight and the spot price jumps up. It is going to pull the curve up with it but you're going to have backwardation. Why is that? Because you have negative cost to carry now because the convenience yield, the convenience yield is the yield you get from holding it. And that's why it's called the convenience yield. It's, it's, it's in your favor to hold it now. The convenience yield is greater than the costs of carry. So you'll have something in backwardation. So it, it will create something that looks like that. So the further out you go, the lower the price would be. That is indicative of a very tight spot market that is expected to correct at some point in time. That's why you have this, this, this uh, curve, and that is called backwardation. Uh, any idea we can sign up and start using February level three material? Uh, May, I think it's May 9th or May 15th, 16th, something like that four or five weeks uh, you mentioned you would have a video on your investments I'm not going to do a video on my investments I'm going to include it in the portfolio construction uh, module in the applied level and every week I will print my positions if you're interested in what I did today uh, I sold 50 puts for May uh, $17 uh, on AT&T $17 on AT&T and I uh, started a new position, uh, 10 puts, 37.50, uh, Newmont Mining uh, for June, in case you're interested.
can you explain why it's more difficult to securitize 25 year AM with five year resets versus 30 year fix? 30 year fix creates a 30 year bond, right? You can have a 30 year bond, uh, which means, or up to 30 years, so you can sell these bonds and uh, they have, uh, you can hear that, eh? Someone's angry up there. You have 30 year bonds, a potential for 30 year bonds, and then you have them tranched, time tranched, so that as the prepayments come in, they go to the first tranche, then the second tranche. So this protects you against extension risk. This protects you against contraction risk. Let's say you wanted a long term bond, you would buy the time tranche uh, where you got prepayments last. Uh, prepayments are uh, exactly that somebody pays off their mortgage early. Well, imagine if you had 25 years and you had five year, the five year resets. The most you could have is a five year bond because they'd all be prepaid. Because when you go back to the bank to renegotiate your mortgage, it is a brand new mortgage. You're not just renegotiating the existing mortgage, you get, it's, it, it replaces the existing mortgage as a whole new mortgage. Uh, so the most you could have are five year mortgage backed securities. That's it because you'd be paid off within those five years. So it doesn't lend itself well to having uh, a security uh, that could be maybe up to a seven year, that maybe could be up to a 12 year, and that could be 12 year plus. So you don't have this ability to time tranche. They're all short term bonds. Uh, thoughts on what implications there could possibly be for our employment surveys and jobs reports? I believe the lack of immigrant data within our economic indicators in general might be skewing some of these types of data. Um, well, whenever you sample, you, you introduce errors. So sampling error is one of them. We may not be sampling the entire population. Is there a bias in the population that suggests that we're not? Uh, if immigrants, especially illegals, are not uh, sampled, uh, and refuse to participate even if they were, then you would have a bias. So yes, there would be some sampling, a sampling error there, which is why it's important to look at the 90% confidence interval. And if the 90% confidence interval contains zero, well then uh, it is no different than zero. So it tells you, I think uh, for the job numbers, the 90% confidence interval is 120,000. Or, uh, there is it 160,000 something like that so if uh, the economy did 150,000 jobs that's anywhere from negative 10,000 to 310 since the interval contains zero that is really is no different statistically it's no different than zero just randomness puts it at 150 so to account for the size of the sampling errors it, it is uh, uh, important to look at the the con the 90 percent confidence interval and determine whether or not uh, the number you're looking at, uh, if the interval contains zero, if it does, well then, then the number is no different statistically, no different than zero. Uh, where are we here? Could you touch on your thoughts regarding the divergence of Apple's performance with the other Mag Seven stocks, mostly due to China supply trust and antitrust worries? Pretty much, yeah. Those are big ones. What price would you leg or sell in? I haven't looked at Apple for a while, so I don't know. I don't know what number I would would use. Target's still a good option to sell puts. At one twenty, I thought Target was a good option to sell puts when it was down uh, around there. Where are we now? One seventy on on Target? Nah, eh, not really. I think they're they're easier fights to win. Um, like the seventeen dollar puts on AT and T, I think those are just easier fights to win. Thoughts on potential Canada immigration reduction with Polyev likely coming into office? Yeah, that's not till 2025. Uh, that's a long time away. Impact on Canadian outlook for Capri? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's a you know there's a lot that can happen in between now and then, uh, including uh, including being taken uh, taken out by private equity. Uh, that likes to hold on to these kind of things, so um, which is not out of line. Uh, I think a private equity firm just took out a uh, Canadian, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an apartment REIT in the U.S. Uh, this week, so it's not uh, it's not unlikely. How will lower rates affect banks' profitability? Uh, I don't think it'll affect their profitability. It probably increase their profitability. 
um, it will certainly raise the value of any fixed rate loan that they have or, or a fixed rate asset. Uh, opinion on the current pricing of Google sitting near all time highs, right? Current valuation seems difficult due to its high weight and overvalued SPY. What are they just sitting under two trillion now? Man, do you hear that back there? We are getting dumped on today. Whew. Also, Canadian apartment rate is your optimistic position on it only for uh, any apartment rate in general. In Canada, I'd say any apartment rate in general. Being a U.S. investor, what's the best way to get exposure to Canadian apartment rental market? I don't see cap rate on Schwab. That could be a limitation of, Swa of Schwab. It is loud. I don't know if you can hear that, but it is loud. Uh, yeah, I think we'll, uh, how much do we have to go here? Oh, we're almost done. I was going to say, I think we got to stop, but let me just finish up here. I'll just get closer. Every time I, I, I get closer to the microphone, this thing gets louder. Someone age 25. Do you think they should worry about the, okay, this is too loud. We're going to, we're going to stop here. That's it. Uh, that's it for the week.